from the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for May 2010. I am Kristen Jenkins. Hominins, a term that includes modern humans and their ancestors, have been around for about 4 million years, starting with Australopithecines, but our species, Homo sapiens, didn't make an appearance until about 200,000 years ago. Far from being the sole representative species of hominins that we are now, it appears that early Homo sapiens shared the landscape with other hominin species. For example, we've known for a long time that Neanderthals overlapped with early Homo sapiens in much of Europe, and new evidence suggests that until about 40,000 years ago, when the Neanderthals disappeared, ancient humans and Neanderthals lived close enough to be interbreeding. In 2003, scientists discovered the skeletons of a potentially new species of human, Homo floresiensis, or hobbits. If this group does turn out to be a new species, they may have overlapped with modern humans until as recently as 12,000 years ago. If these hominin species coexisted with Homo sapiens, what other species might have been our neighbors? And here we get to the topic of this evolution in the news story the discovery of an unexpected neighbor from about 40,000 years ago in the Altai Mountains in Russia. In addition to studying fossils and artifacts, such as art and tools, scientists have figured out how to extract DNA from very old bones, 40,000 years or older. When scientists applied this technology to a very small find, one bone from a pinky finger, they made a very big discovery. The DNA from this bone found in a layer that dates to between 48,000 to 30,000 years ago, does not match DNA from ancient Homo sapiens or Neanderthals, the species scientists expected to find. This doesn't necessarily mean we've discovered another species, or even a really new neighbor. It does mean we've got a mystery on our hands, or in someone's pinky, that we'll need more information to solve. Dr. John Hawks is an anthropologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He spoke with us about this mysterious DNA and how it fits into the big picture of human evolution. I'm John Hawks. I'm an associate professor of anthropology at uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, my research interests are in genetics of recent humans, uh, so the evolution of our species in the last 40,000 years and human evolution more broadly. Uh, so I do research on Neanderthals in particular and also earlier kinds of humans. And we're interested in how they relate to us genetically and what we can learn about our evolution from looking at those ancient people. We know that evidence of multiple hominin species has been found in Africa, Asia, and Europe and the question with this story is where the mystery hominin fits into this overall hominin map. Dr. Hawks sets the stage for this discovery by sketching out a brief overview of what we know about who was where and when. Initially, hominins, that's the kinds of organisms that are more closely related to living people than to chimpanzees and other kinds of primates, hominins lived in Africa and nowhere else. They originated about 6 million to 5 million years ago. They evolved in Africa, and we call those early hominins Australopithecines. Australopithecines are basically ape-like, except for the fact that they walk upright like we do. They were bipeds. Australopithecines survived until about 1.5 million years ago. 2 million years ago, we begin to find a kind of hominin that has a larger brain, and we call those homo. Homo is divided into at least two or three different species and potentially more. The initial one, Homo habilis, was small-bodied like earlier hominins and had a much smaller brain than we do, but maybe twice the size of an Australopithecine. After that, Homo erectus emerges out of Africa and begins to colonize the rest of the world. So they spread into Asia, they spread across South Asia into China, into Indonesia, uh, which at that time was connected by land to the Asian mainland, and into Europe. So that dispersal was accomplished by hominids that are 1.8 million years ago, 
not very much like us, except in their size, in their diet, and in being a little more sophisticated than we think any earlier hominids had been. Those people who left Africa diversified, and they diversified within Africa. And so we find different skeletal features represented in different populations. Within Europe, they begin to become what we call Neanderthals. Uh, and this process really took almost the whole 1.8 million years. In Asia, we continue to call them Homo erectus, although they evolve in that part of the world too. The major features that are changing in all these regions of the world is that the brains are getting bigger and the teeth are getting smaller. And you think, what are we like compared to those early people? Mainly, we have bigger brains and smaller teeth. So this process is one that encompassed all the populations. Scientists have developed a fascinating picture of hominin evolution with details about how and where different species lived. And this picture is being further fleshed out by ongoing research. But how do scientists study something or someone that doesn't exist anymore? So from today's point of view, we're looking at different kinds of evidence today to understand the relationships of these ancient people. One kind of evidence that we look at, that we've looked at for more than 100 years, is their fossil remains. You know, we study the morphological features to see how they are similar to each other, and how they're different, and whether the pattern can be explained in terms of ancient communities that were evolving in different populations. A second component of evidence, which is also we've had for a long time, is the archaeological record. We look at evidence of their behavior. I'm especially interested in the Neanderthals for a lot of reasons, but to use them as an example, in the last days of the Neanderthals, after about 40,000 years ago, they're making artifacts that are artifacts that modern humans today make in different parts of the world. They're using pigments to paint themselves, and we have, you know, we have the little pieces of rock that they actually rubbed on themselves, and we find the traces of their wear. You know, they were either rubbing their skin or hides. And this is you know, it's something that other kinds of animals don't do. It's something that's human. And we can look at them and say, they're so close to us. You know, can this be because there's similar selective pressures that have changed their cognition as ours? Or are we really connected to them? The third component of what we look at now is genetics. And what's really exciting in the last 10 to 15 years is that we've been able to extract DNA out of these ancient fossils. And using that DNA, we can line it up next to the sequences from living people, and we can compare them to each other. How are they similar? How are they different? Do we have genes from them that are still here now? And the extent to which we're different from them, do those differences have any kind of functional importance? You know, are they making us new? Are they making us different? And what we can say now, because we have really a significant discovery of the Neanderthal genome, is that they're related to us maybe more closely than any of us ever thought. These three lines of evidence provide a lot of information about extinct hominins, but in some cases the evidence needs to be interpreted carefully. Different lines of evidence may appear to give contradictory results, but by understanding the science underlying these differences, scientists are able to reconcile the results and draw reasonable conclusions. One example of this problem is often encountered when comparing phylogenies, because phylogenies drawn based on the relationships of gene sequences and phylogenies based on the relationships of species can give different results. Dr. Hawks explained why. One of the real challenges in studying the genetics of, of living species and also of these ancient remains is the fact that different genes can tell different stories about relationships. And this is a problem in genetics that we call the problem of gene trees versus species trees or population trees. In human evolution, in the past two million years, we know that we, people were living in different parts of the world. We know that there were populations there. If we find a gene in a living population and ask, 
what's the genealogy that connects the copies of this gene to each other, that genealogy will go back some distance in the past. It often goes back, the, the relation between copies of a gene goes back farther than the origins of this population that the gene is now in. And if it goes back far enough, and in modern humans, our genes, genealogies tend to go back 500,000, 600, 800,000 years or more, that's a long time. That's a time at which modern humans as a population didn't exist, and more ancient kinds of humans were living in different parts of the world. If we compare a Neanderthal genome to the genome of a living person, we'll find that in many cases the Neanderthal has the same gene as a living person because they inherited it from their common ancestor. And the people today could be different from each other because their relationships go back further than that common ancestor, even though the population diverged at a later time and the people are at parts of this population. So it's a mismatch between the trees of relationships of genes and the trees that connect populations. Nowhere is that more apparent than a recent find just this spring in Siberia, in the Altai Mountains, in a cave, there's a layer that dates to the Upper Paleolithic, and it's got interesting stuff in it. It's got a bracelet that's made out of stone that was really ground to be a smooth bracelet. That's cool stuff. That's stuff that archaic humans didn't do, and so we, it's really archaeologically very interesting. In this layer was a bone of, of a pinky, and that anatomically usually tells us basically nothing, but they were able to obtain genome sequence out of this pinky bone. The first thing that they sequenced was the mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA of this bone is divergent from humans and divergent from the human Neanderthal common ancestor. So the gene tree is telling us that humans and Neanderthals are close and this pinky bone is further. Now the question is, what does that mean for the population? Is this a population? that was further from us than Neanderthals are. And it could be. We know that people were living in Asia from 1.8 million years ago. This genetic divergence from the mitochondrial DNA looks like a million years ago, and that means that it could have been a member of that early population, or maybe a later population that came in at some later time. Or it could be that there was a larger population that included Neanderthals, maybe it included living people, that was large enough that the genealogies made this pattern of the genes. The way to solve this problem is to look at more genes. And of course, in this case, that's what they're doing. They're going to sequence more of the genome. It's one of the real challenges in reconstructing relationships. We asked Dr. Hawks how he became an anthropologist and what he enjoys most about his work. I got into science by the most random route uh, because as an undergraduate, I was an English major. I wasn't really thinking of a career that involved genetics or anthropology, but I liked anthropology and so I took a couple anthro courses and at Kansas State, where I was a student, we didn't have a graduate program. Uh, so there were introductory courses that had teaching assistants and my professor, Mike Finnegan, gave me the chance to be a TA. And so by teaching it, I really got into anthropology and understood, oh, this is, you know, this is a real interesting career. One of the coolest things uh, I've gotten to do is go to the cave where they, have the, where they found the, the DNA from these fossils. You know, the fossils come from Vindia Cave, which is in Croatia. And I've been to Croatia many times for my work. And uh, when I went to this cave, I was, uh, you know, it's the most perfect cave you could ever imagine. It's got this huge amphitheater-like you know, area, and outside of the entrance of the cave is totally green. You, know, you can just imagine what it was like to live there really 45,000 years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's such a wonderful place. So I think of that, you know, being at the places where these people lived and being able to bring new stories about their lives and really bring them to life. You know, that's the excitement of, of being an anthropologist today. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, 
Visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.